In this video, we're going to talk about the intermolecular forces in separation techniques that you're going to use in this lab. So we're going to talk about four different uh, techniques that you'll use in the lab. Um, one uh, is filtration, the second is recrystallization, the third is extractions, which also include acid-base extractions, and the last is distillation. In filtration, what you're ultimately separating is a solid and a liquid. It may be that you originally started with two different solids and one of those solids was then dissolved in a liquid, but ultimately it's a solid and a liquid you're trying to separate. And this separation is based on differential solubilities. Recrystallization is a technique that allows you to separate two different solids. Again, guiding principle for the separation is differential solubilities. The third technique is extraction, which includes acid-base extractions. Um, ultimately, in an extraction, you're separating two liquids. Most often, you started with two solids and you dissolved those um, in a solvent so that you have a liquid. Um, if you started with a liquid that you're trying to separate, again, you're going to have to take that liquid and dissolve it in a solvent so that you can use the extraction. Um, so ultimately, you could have two solids that you're trying to separate two liquids that you're trying to separate or a solid and a liquid that you're trying to separate. But when you're actually doing the extraction, you've got two, uh, two liquid phases that you're working with. Um, again, those um, separations are based on differential solubilities. And then the fourth technique here is distillation. And in distillation, you're separating two liquids. And in this case, the separation is based on differences in boiling points. So the first three of these techniques are based on differential solubilities. So let's talk about what we mean by differential solubilities. So by solubility, we're talking about whether two things um, will mix or whether, the, whether they'll dissolve in each other. And so for um, compounds to mix or to be soluble in that way, we want to think about uh, Gibbs free energy. And we know that Gibbs free energy needs to be negative for a process to be favorable. So if our mixing is going to be favorable, the Gibbs free energy term needs to be negative. If we look at this from a pure mathematical perspective, we've got a delta H term here, an enthalpy term, and a delta S term here, uh, an entropy term, uh, which also um, is temperature dependent. So for delta G to be negative, delta H could be negative and or minus T delta S could be negative or any combination of those things. Um, and so let's talk about this for a minute. So if we're talking about compounds becoming soluble and let's think about entropy. For entropy, we're thinking about how disordered a system is. So if we take a solid and we dissolve it in a liquid, we increase the entropy of the system. There's more um, randomness to the system in a liquid phase than there is to, in, in, the solid, in the solid phase, uh, more motions, more microstates. So in that case, uh, a solid going into a liquid, um, the change in entropy would be favorable. A favorable change in entropy would be positive. That means this minus T delta S term here would be negative. That's a good thing if we're looking for a negative delta G. If we're talking about a liquid dissolving in another liquid, generally, unless you're talking about a highly ordered liquid, you're going to have more microstates when two different liquids are mixed together. Um, and so highly ordered liquids, we're going to just put those off to the side and not think about those um, at this point. So let's think about delta H. When we think about delta H, the change in enthalpy, what we're really thinking about is the change in bonding. Um, and as we're talking about differential solubilities, the types of bonding that we're thinking about are intermolecular forces. And so you've talked about intermolecular forces in classes, hydrogen bonding, dipole interaction, induced dipole interactions, ionic interactions. Those are the same intermolecular forces that we're going to think about here. And so if you want to think about whether or not two compounds are going to be soluble, um, a way to approach this would be to think about what's the major intermolecular force that compound has interacting with itself, and then how does that change if that compound now has to interact with a different compound? And so I've got four solvents up here that we can think about. We've got water, methanol, hexane, and benzene. So if we look at water, 
the major intermolecular force that water has is hydrogen bonding. And so I'm just going to put HB here for hydrogen bonding. If we look at methanol and think about the structure of methanol, draw a Lewis structure for methanol, again, the major intermolecular force in methanol is going to be hydrogen bonding. So I'll put an HB here. If we look at hexane, the major intermolecular force in hexane, the only intermolecular force in hexane, is an induced dipole, so ID. And if we look at benzene, again, the only intermolecular force in benzene interacting with itself is an induced dipole, so I'll put an ID. So when we need to think about solubilities, what we have to ask is, okay, so if I take a compound like water and I mix it with methanol, how do the intermolecular forces change? If I have water by itself, we said it's hydrogen bonding as the major force. If I have methanol by itself, hydrogen bonding is the major force. If I mix those two together, water now needs to interact with methanol and methanol not, now needs to interact with water. They break some of the hydrogen bonding they had to themselves, but they now hydrogen bond to the other compound. So we've gone from a hydrogen bonding situation to a hydrogen bonding situation. There's not a lot of change in energy associated there. So delta A in this case, it's gonna be small. It may be positive, it may be negative, but it's gonna be a small number. And the del delta G here would be dominated by the change in entropy, which we said is gonna be favorable. So if we take two compounds that have similar intermolecular forces and we try to mix them together, this is an example of likes dissolve likes. And that's gonna be favorable from the perspective of Gibbs free energy. Same thing if we think about hexane and benzene. Uh, hexane has induced dipole interactions with itself. Benzene has induced dipole interactions with itself. If we're gonna ask these two to mix, we're gonna break some induced dipole interactions that hexane had with itself and some that benzene had with itself, but we're gonna form them, again, induced dipole interactions when hexane and benzene interact with each other. So we've broken induced dipole interactions, but we formed induced dipole interactions. So again, delta H is gonna be small here, maybe small positive, maybe small negative. Um, and again, the change in Gibbs free energy is gonna be dominated by delta S, which is favorable. So the Gibbs free energy is gonna be negative. It's gonna be a favorable process. So again, that's an example of likes dissolve likes because they have the same type of intermolecular forces. What happens if we take methanol and we now put it in hexane? Methanol interacts with itself by hydrogen bonding. Hexane interacts with itself by induced dipole interactions. If we put these two together, the only type of interactions that they're gonna have with each other are induced dipole interactions. And so that means if methanol has to break hydrogen bonding interactions, which are a very strong intermolecular interaction, to form weak induced dipole interactions, that's not gonna be favorable. Delta H in this case is not gonna be negative, it's gonna be positive, and that's not favorable. And so in this case, our delta G is gonna be positive, it's an unfavorable process, these are not gonna mix. So this is not likes dissolving in likes, these are unlike things um, trying to dissolve in each other. Okay, so when you're thinking about differential solubilities, think about what are the intermolecular uh, the major strongest intermolecular forces that a compound has with itself, what would be the major intermolecular forces if a compound was going to interact with another molecule? If they're really similar, chances are the compounds are going to be soluble. If they're really different um, and you're forming much weaker interactions in the mixing, then the, it's very likely that the um, mixing is not going to happen. So let's look at these four different techniques. So filtration, what we're ultimate, ultimately separating is a solid and a liquid. Again, we might start out with two solids and one of them will dissolve in something before we, have our, before we uh, do the filtration. So uh, let me show you an example of what the apparatus looks like. Um, here's a filter flask. It's connected um, by a tube to a vacuum. So a pull a vacuum on this filter flask. There's a capture here. There's a funnel up here, and on the funnel, the funnel is a filter paper. And so what you do is you take your mixture, which is a solid and a liquid, and you pour it into the top of here. The, the solid is caught in this filter paper. The liquid goes through into the flask. 
And so you have the solid in your filter paper, the liquid in the flask, and now you've separated your mixture. Um, and so this is a really easy technique to use if you have a solid and a liquid. Um, so let me give you an example here. If you had a mixture, which was a solid white powder composed of sucrose and aspirin, and you were asked to separate those, filtration would be a technique that you could use. And so again, we're going to have to talk about differential solubilities. If you look at su sucrose, OH, 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 oxygen, 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 it's a huge amount of hydrogen bonding possible in sucrose. It's a very, very polar molecule. If you look at aspirin, it does have some polar groups on it. It's got a, a carboxylic acid up here. Um, it's got an ester here, but it's also got this big hydrophobic portion of it. And so it's going to be soluble in a compound that's much less polar than a compound that uh, then sucrose will be soluble in. So if you take something like methylene chloride and use this as your solvent or the compound that you want to dissolve your solids in, methylene chloride has a carbon chlorine bond that has a dipole. So it's got some polarity to it, but it's got no hydrogen bonding capabilities to it. And so what's gonna be true is that aspirin will dissolve in methylene chloride. This will become your liquid. And sucrose will not dissolve in methylene chloride because there's, there's just not enough polarity. And so this will be your solid. And so you can take this mixture, put it uh, on top of the um, filter paper up here, pour it through the filter paper, um, and sucrose, which is your solid, will be collected in the filter paper and aspirin, which is dissolved in the methylene chloride, will be in the liquid phase there, and you've separated the two. Okay, the second and third techniques are really techniques um, used to separate two solids, recrystallization and extractions. Again, both of them are based on differential solubilities. I'm not gonna talk about extractions here. There's a separate video on acid-base extractions that I will refer you to. Um, but recrystallization, so let's talk about this. So recrystallization is a technique where you take um, two solids and what you try to do is find a solvent, a liquid, where one of these two solids is soluble in the liquid, but the other one isn't. Um, and so at the end, you have a solid and you have a liquid and the solid is one of your compounds and the liquid has your other compound dissolved in it. And in that way, you separate them out. To do a recrystallization, what the key is, is finding a solvent, finding a liquid that both of the compounds that you're trying to separate in will dissolve in while that solvent is hot, but only one of which will dissolve in when that liquid is cold. So you're going to take your two solids, you're going to add your solvent to them, you're going to heat the mixture up, and once the mixture is heated up, both of the compounds will be in solution. So it'll look like you have a uh, uh, just a, it'll look like you have just a liquid. Both of the solids will have dissolved. And then you let that flask that has this mixture and it cool down to room temperature. And then you take it and you put it in an ice water bath. And so that you're cooling down the mixture, you're cooling down the mixture. And one of the two compounds that you were trying to separate is not gonna be soluble in this solvent at the colder temperature. And it will come crashing out as solid. And so once you've got that, you've got a solid and a liquid, and you can go to your filtration technique and separate them. Your chance of success in this technique goes up exponentially um, the greater the differences in the solubility between the hot and the cold, between the compounds in the hot and the cold solvent are. So if a compound is really, really soluble in um, a, the cold salt, Salt so is really soluble when the, when the solvent is cold, but not when it's hot, that's a good thing. And if you're looking at the two different compounds, one of these compounds, again, needs to be much, much more, much more soluble in the cold solvent than the other one does, or else you're not going to separate them out. You're going to continue to have a mixture. Um, there are tables that you can use to look up how soluble particular compounds are in particular solvents, ranging from very soluble to not very soluble uh, to exceedingly soluble. And some of, sometimes you can get these quantitative grams per milliliter. Um, sometimes it's trial and error. 
Um, and so again, you're going to start with um, basic principles of like dissolve like. So you can look at the intermolecular interactions that your molecule might have with the solvent to predict whether or not it's going to be soluble. Um, recrystallization is actually a technique that's more often used for purifications than separations, where you've done a reaction and you have a, a, a product that you've made and you have a little bit of an impurity in that product that you're trying to separate out. Um, and that impurity can either be insoluble in the hot solvent, in which case you filter out while it's hot, or it can be soluble in the cold solvent, in which case your product is insoluble and you filter it out. And then the last technique that I want to talk about is distillation. And this is a technique that's used to separate two liquids, and it's based on the differences in the boiling points between two liquids. And so over here on the left is an apparatus for a simple distillation. And there's four, uh, four different types of distillations that you can do based on um, the liquids that you're trying to separate. So what's shown over here is a hot plate. Um, hot plate is used to heat up an oil bath. And in that oil bath is a round bottom flask that has the two liquids that you want to separate in it. So we've got two liquids here. And so we start to heat them up, we start to heat them up, we start to heat them up. The compound that has the boiling point will first, um, at the lower temperature, will start to go from the liquid phase up into the gas phase. As it goes up into the gas phase, it goes up into this condenser. Um, and once it gets up here, it goes down into this tube. And this tube is jacketed by um, water running through it. And so it cools this tube down. And so the gas um, molecules that are in here are cooled um, back down to the liquid and they drip into a flask where they're collected. And so the this is what's happening with the lower boiling co point compound. The higher boiling point compound needs to still be sitting over here in this flask for this separation to actually happen. Um, so as a reminder, to boil, molecules in the liquid must overcome their intermolecular forces to get into the gas phase. Um, and boiling point is determined by the strength and the number of intermolecular forces. For distillation to work, the greater the difference in the boiling point between the two compounds that you're trying to separate are, the more likely you are to succeed um, with this as a technique for purification. Um, and as I mentioned, there's uh, multiple types of distillation that can be used depending upon the types of compounds that you're trying to separate and how close the boiling points are. So in summary, for all of these techniques, what's going to be true is that intermolecular forces are going to play a big role either in differential solubilities or in differential boiling points that are going to be needed to separate compounds.